Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Cornwell, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development here at Plunkett Cooney. It's my pleasure to serve as coordinator for today's program, which is sponsored by our Commercial Litigation Practice Group. The business landscape, as we all know, is littered with failed deals. Many of these failed ventures result from poorly crafted agreements. When it comes to drafting contracts, there are some time-tested do's and don'ts that everyone in business should know. Fortunately, one of Plunkett Cooney's Commercial Litigation Practice Group co-leaders, Matt Betcher, is here with us today to provide his top 10 list of contracting do's and don'ts. Before we get started, I'd like to take a few minutes to provide you with some background about today's speaker and our law firm. For those of you who don't know, Plunkett Cooney is based in Southeast Michigan and is one of the Midwest's oldest and largest law firms with approximately 150 attorneys. We have eight offices in, uh, in Michigan, as well as in Chicago, Illinois, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Columbus, Ohio. Plunkett Cooney's Commercial Litigation Practice Group represents a broad range of clients in litigation, arbitration, and other forms of alternative dispute resolution concerning matters that arise while conducting business. Our clients are Fortune 500 companies, state and federal financial institutions, uh, uh, small and mid-sized businesses, limited liability companies, partnerships, sole proprietorships, and even, even some individuals. As I mentioned, we're joined today by Matt Betcher, who is a co-leader of our commercial litigation practice group. He has over 30 years of experience handling commercial litigation matters and specializes in handling real property issues, banking conflicts, contract disputes, class action defense, and business torts. Um, he serves as a uh, uh, a, a longtime member of our management team, so we're really uh, fortunate to have him here. And uh, so welcome, Matt. And uh, as I wrap up here and get ready to hand it off to him, I just want to touch base on a couple housekeeping notes and we'll get started. For today's Q&A portion of the program, we're going to use our questions window on your dashboard. So I would ask everybody to just take a second to try to find that now. If any questions arise in your mind during the course of the, the discussion with Matt here, type those in, and at the end of the program, I'm going to come back on the line and try to read as many of those as time permits. The only caveat that I add is that we want to keep those questions as, a, as general as we can. We don't want to get into the specifics of any one matter or your, or your particular situation just to protect um, identities and whatnot. So please keep those somewhat uh, general if you can. Uh, finally, I want to mention that today's session is being recorded, and that recording will be available hopefully later today on Plunkett Cooney's website, which is located at plunkettcooney.com. So if there's anybody that you know that missed this prep program, they can always uh, view the recording later. So thanks again for attending the webinar. Uh, now let's get started. Matt, you're up, so take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I wanted to uh, preface my remarks with a, a few comments, the, the most important of which is that's a terrible picture of me. I don't know, look nearly that old, and I've lost some weight. So I think we're going to have that picture reshot. Um, and uh, as we proceed, I also want to caution um, that uh, this will not be funny. I was told. Uh, when I was giving a seminar a couple weeks ago on antitrust that uh, I, I should not attempt, attempt to be funny. And I was thinking to myself, it was 8 in the morning, and I'm talking about antitrust in the healthcare industry. I said, funny isn't going to be any sort of a problem. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about today are amusing to me only in hindsight uh, because I'm not dealing with them now. Um, they're, they're the types of things that if you thought about it, you say, who on earth would ever do those types of things? But they happen all the time, and they do create uh, disputes that very often mature into litigation. So the, the, the purpose of this uh, webinar is not to try to tell any of you out there who draft contracts for a living how to draft contracts. Uh, I do not draft contracts for a living. Um, I can't do what you do. I don't want to do what you do. Uh, but I am an expert at cleaning up after you've done what you've done. And some of the things that I say today, I, I'm hoping uh, will be helpful to you uh, as you proceed in, in what you do and, and drafting your contracts. 
Some of them will seem painfully obvious, but believe it or not, everything that I'm going to talk about today um, has resulted in uh, very expensive litigation. So um, let's get into it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to call this a top 10. Uh, you're going to find out there's actually more than 10. But let's start with uh, drafting the deal before you have a deal. So what am I actually talking about? Um, I'm not talking about the lawyer who comes into a deal with a checklist or who uh, comes into a deal with a matrix or you know some preordained plan as to how the deal should be structured. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm actually talking about uh, the lawyer uh, who comes to the negotiation with a with a contract already in place because in his or her opinion, this deal probably is going to look like a deal they did uh, previously. So why start from scratch? Um, and there's some validity to that. We'll talk about using forms a little bit later, but uh, I, I, I always caution uh, anyone who asks me, don't, don't start with preordained ideas or concepts as to what the contract is actually going to look like, because very rarely does it hold true. Um, and, I, and I should say at this, at this moment, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be offering a lot of generalizations because uh, as we know, contracts can cover a myriad of, of uh, subjects, you know, from real estate to sale of goods to employment uh, to retail to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Some of my comments are going to be very applicable to some types of con contracts. Some will not. Um, I'm not trying to suggest that everything I say is going to be applicable to everything. but um, trying to negotiate a deal with a document in hand um, is, in my experience, a bad idea. Um, too often, uh, there's, there's far too many moving parts um, to try to pigeonhole them into uh, contract language that is already there. Um, and lawyers who find themselves trying to negotiate based upon preordained ideas that currently exist in a form uh, will oftentimes find themselves clinging to points that aren't really in dispute. Um, the item might not need to be there, um, or it's not really going to be terribly important at the end of the day when uh, this deal comes to close. So what I have always suggested is come in with a term sheet or a letter of intent if you have one. Um, certainly come in with your checklist to make sure that you know all of the items that need to be discussed are discussed. Um, or if you've got a, a complex deal, you know come in with your matrix that or your flow chart that shows all of the different collateral documents. And I'm not using that term literally. Um, are, are covered, uh, but don't come into the negotiation room with a contract in your hand expecting the other side to bend to your will. It, it, it almost never happens that way. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, when you're drafting your deal, um, and you're trying to come, you know, you're trying to get ahead of the curve, so to speak. So even if your deal does look like something you've done before, um, coming to a, a final draft document while terms are still open, um, also in my, in my experience is a bad idea. You know, for the reasons I've listed here, speculative, it's inefficient, it's self-defeating. Um, but what I've also found is that in addition to those things, which are kind of self-defining and, and obvious, um, it tends to create problems in the drafting 
that that were largely unanticipated. Um, items that were negotiated at the very beginning, for example, your your set of defined terms, um, those can sometimes change at the very end, or you're adding new terms, or you're tweaking terms that previously were, were defined. Um, and when you are trying to draft before you have that finality, um, you're going to miss things, or even worse, and this is going to be a theme you're going to hear me talk about again and again, uh, you're going to create some inconsistency in your final uh, work product, which um, is the, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the hope of all commercial litigators, that, that your, your contract is inconsistent, because that's where you're going to get your, your fights, and that's where, um, you know, the lawsuits are going to be born. So, um, again, as an overarching theme, and, and this really isn't so much a litigation theme as, as much as it is um, just a forewarning, uh, wait till you have all your terms before you start drafting your deal. Um, okay, let's move on. Number two, um, while you're negotiating, I do want folks to think about how best to document the agreement. And again, this goes back to your checklist or your matrix, or, or a lot of people on the phone might simply say, well, I know what's supposed to be there. Uh, I know what documents need to be included. You know, this might be a single document deal, or there might be multiple documents. Um, don't tell me better how I, you know, how to document my deal, I know it. Um, and I defer to the to the contract drafters of, on that point, but what I'm suggesting here is, um, and I've seen this from experience, that when deals are being negotiated, oftentimes there are time constraints. Deals need to close um, for a variety of reasons. You know, you may only have a title commitment for so many days. You, only, you may only have um, you know, your, your financials are only good for so long. Um, you know, your uh, professional opinions that might be relied upon might, might have their time limitations on them as well. Um, so this kind of goes back to this issue of, you know, and you see where I mentioned their flow charts. You could just as easily substitute matrix or, or checklist or um, you know, borrowing from your own experience. But when you are uh, talking about the deal and trying to structure it, understand everything that's going to need to be there. Uh, again, from experience, I've, I've seen deals that have matured into litigation, and then when I go back and I uh, try to put together the, uh, the documents of origin, um, I see that they've been drafted in a variety of ways by a variety of people, obviously at different times because they're fraught with inconsistent language. Um, they, don't, they don't seem to fit together as well. Um, and you can just tell that there, there was some last minute additions. Now, sometimes that just happens, and I acknowledge that. Sometimes uh, to get the deal done, uh, documents have to be thrown in at the last minute. Um, but a lot of times, you know, as, as you on the phone will, will tell me, um, you know, if you're going to do this type of deal, you need these five documents, or that type of a deal, you need these three documents. So you will know many times what you need to get the deal done. Um, my experience is get, the, get those all out front as part of your negotiations. Make sure everybody understands um, everything that needs to be accomplished in order to, uh, to close this deal. Because, uh, you know, I'm sure from your own experiences, you, you well know, you're sometimes dealing with people who don't know everything that needs to be included, who don't have your understanding of 
what these documents are, why they're important, or why they need to be included. And so while you may be on top of the ball, the other side may not be. So um, again, this is one and two kind of go together um, as far as uh, you know, avoiding disputes in the future. It's just being getting it all out on the table so that everybody can see and everybody understands uh, what's being accomplished in order to reach a closing. All right, moving on. This is one of my favorite pet peeves um, because my transactional partners and, and colleagues at other law firms um, over the years guard their own forms uh, very jealously, if not under lock and key, uh, because they've spent a career developing them, and they they just uh, it, it it creates such a sense of security. Uh, and there's some validity to that truth, um, but as a litigator, I want to caution transactional lawyers uh, not to rely upon your form bank. Uh, when doing your deal. Um, your, your forms are important because they do represent uh, your history of experience, your you know, tried and true language, so to speak. Um, but I have seen time and time again where transactional lawyers simply pull, you know, we'll use a commercial lease as an example, pull the commercial lease out of the drawer Say, this has everything I'm going to need. All I really need to do is pare it down, take out the stuff I don't need, um, and maybe add a few things that are unique to this deal. I know that's how it happens a lot of times, um, but therein lies the danger because rarely do I see any deal uh, the same as the other. Now, you, of course, may may be working at a bank. You say, you know what, on a commercial mortgage, these are the forms and they have to be signed and there's no negotiation, blah, blah, blah. Or if you're leasing out a commercial space, you say, this is the, this is the form lease we're going to use. There's not going to be a lot of changes to them. And there's truth to that. Um, so I'm not necessarily talking about your institutionally vetted documents. Um, in this discussion, although I will say some of those tend to be the worst documents because they're they're many times created by committee uh, or they were approved years ago and nobody's looked at them since. And since we've been using them for years, there's that belief that they're they're uh, impervious to, to criticism. Far from it, you know, the law changes. Um, even vernacular changes within documents. People refer to things today differently than they did before, years ago. Um, so resist the, temp the temptation to simply over-rely. I'm not saying jettison them by any means, um, but take your forms, use them as best you can, but then look at them again critically after you've completed your draft and make sure that you're not kind of shoehorning your deal into this pre pre-existing form um, that this that this now new document actually truly reflects the deal that you were trying to strike. Um, reliance upon forms, in my experience as a litigator, uh, tends to allow not so much mistakes but there can be mistakes, but simply oversight. Uh, you overlook the fact that that wasn't an issue in this deal that you're using the form from, but it's now an issue in this new deal. And if you haven't criticized your own document to reflect that new issue, uh, that's a problem that's waiting to, uh, to pop up. So number three is don't over rely on your forms. Number four is, of course, don't fail to rely upon your forms. I see lawyers um, time and again 
oftentimes less experienced lawyers, but lawyers of all ilk who start from scratch. They don't rely upon tried and true language. Um, you know, there are some things that won't change. Um, once you get a, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in the program, but once you get a good um, uh, default clause, that can be your default clause. Um, now you may choose to tweak it based upon, you know, the, the realities of your new deal, but um, there's no reason to have to recreate these types of, we'll call them boilerplate, uh, sections time and again um, and frankly when when that happens and again oftentimes it happens with inexperienced lawyers um, or lawyers too willing to simply incorporate someone else's language into the document and I should take an aside here and say I always prefer to be the drafting lawyer when I'm drafting a document for example, if I'm drafting a, a, an arbitration agreement or a settlement agreement or something of that sort, I want to be the lawyer who drafts it because uh, I'd rather be the one uh, who is negotiating from my own language rather than trying to understand why some other lawyer put something in that I typically would not. Um, so do rely upon your own forms. Um, you know, use your own experience. Use that history. Uh, there is a good chance that if the language hasn't created any issues before, that it's good language. Um, but you're also going to be consistently using uh, defined terms or terms of art. Um, and those are the types of things that courts will look at if there is a dispute later on in, in the process. Um, and if these are terms that have been are typical typical to your industry, uh, the court's going to be looking for those terms to be in your your deal. So uh, number four is don't fail to rely upon your own terms. Number five, don't ignore the definitions. This is another one of my favorites because it's one one that is often given only uh, perfunctory uh, review. And I'm not talking about how you define the parties, for example. You know, is it buyer or seller, or is it mortgagee or mortgagor or lessor or lessee? Not talking about that, although um, from just a readability standpoint, um, I, I often ask my, my transactional partners to step back and re, try to read the, the deal or whatever it is, assuming they don't know anything about it. And, you know, if if all of your terms are ABC company or XYZ company or 123 corporation, that turns into alphabet soup later on. Uh, and it does make it more difficult for a court to understand who's supposed to do what and when and why and all of those things. Um, now, I'm really more talking about uh, the set of defined terms that often gets included in the contract, often at the beginning, but not necessarily. Sometimes there's a glossary, you know, added as an appendix at the end. And this is where you're going to talk about things like, um, you know, a start date or a termination date. <clears throat> excuse me, or a default, um, or any number of things that are important to be defined. Um, those should be scrutinized more than any other, other than the money issues, of course. But when you're talking about drafting, and, and again, with an eye towards a possible dispute and litigation, make sure your definitions are sound ones. Um, if, if your definition is going to deviate from what's generally accepted, make that clear. If your definition uh, can't be understood by a layperson, change it. And, and I throw the judges in that category of lay people. 
you're going to, in a dispute, you're going to find yourself sitting in front of a circuit court judge or a federal district court judge who may not have the slightest idea what your business is, what your contract was intended to, to, uh, to do, or why these defined terms are important. So making the definitions as simple as possible, but as complete as possible, is critical. And, it, and it's very difficult to do. You know, as litigators, we often say it's, it's much more difficult to write a five-page reply brief than it is a 20-page motion for summary judgment brief because you have fewer words to work with and you have to be more precise uh, about your meaning. And, and that I can't overstate in the definitions. Um, and once, once you use the defined terms, make sure they're used consistently throughout the document. I, I refer to that as the mess. I've, I've put, I've, I'm certain I've put one of my kids through college based on the fees that I've charged clients by litigating contracts where defined terms were not consistently used. I had one case years ago, uh, a fight over a commercial lease, where the lease defined uh, at the beginning the lease commencement date and the lease termination date, but throughout the lease, they also referred to the start date uh, the, the commencement date, the acceptance date, um, and nobody really knew at the end of the day whether any of those terms were the same. Um, a court, a judge eventually had to decide that. Um, but again, that, that I was able to track that back to the fact that the lawyer who wrote the lease started with a form that may have referred to a start date, but then in the discussion later it was turned into a commencement date, and later because there was going to be a new build out, there was an acceptance date. And all of those things came in succession in the in the negotiations, and nobody thought anything of it. Um, but therein you had the lawsuit. And that lawsuit went on for two years, and I won't go into into the details about it, but it was a it was a bet the business lawsuit on what was this what did this lease really mean? So um, pay pay especially close attention to the to the definitions, but more importantly than that, it's critical to use those defined terms consistently through the document or documents. Moving on, number six. This is another point that tends to create litigation more often than not. And I refer to it as drafting around the deal. Um, That first point there, resisting the temptation to take advantage of someone else's oversight. That I could probably I could probably spend an hour talking about just that. But I know what happens when deals are negotiated. It it can be fierce, it can be cutthroat. Everybody's trying to uh, find that advantage, and there are no rules. Um, and what I'm talking about here is not not negotiating the deal to the advantage of your client. That's not what I'm talking about. But when you see a, a lawyer on the other side or a party on the other side who plainly missed something, plainly missed something critical, and it's, it's there, but you know that's not what the intent is because you, you know from the, the discussions but the lawyer just missed it. I know there's a temptation to simply leave the language in because it's favorable, but invariably those are the types of things that are gonna, gonna create a lawsuit later um, because there, there likely is going to be other language in the agreement <clears throat> that's supportive of the other side's interpretation. 
And a court could very easily conclude that this language that's just kind of hanging there um, is now ambiguous, and therefore uh, parole evidence is going to come in anyway. Um, my, my suggestion is talk it over with your client, point out what's gone, you know, what's happened, and, and point out the, the realities. You know, if you leave it in, um, it's not necessarily going to be that layup that you expect in, in the event of a dispute. Um, and, and make sure the, the client understands the realities of it, because if you hand them the, the final document and say, here it is, and oh, by the way, you know, we, we've, we've negotiated a really good deal, only for the client to find out two years later they're embroiled in a lawsuit that's costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars of attorney's fees, they're not going to be real pleased. <clears throat> and they're going, to, they're going to wonder why that wasn't dealt with earlier, which gets into number two. Uh, if the deal does have issues, confront them. Um, that's really more what I'm thinking about when I talk about don't draft around the deal. I know there's enormous pressure at times on lawyers to, to get the deal closed. The client hands you certain parameters, certain expectations, and it's up to you to structure it, get it done, get it closed, and move on. Um, but that doesn't mean you want to avoid the issues you know are there. If, if there are points of dispute that, that aren't fully resolved, um, failing to get them fully resolved is really teeing up the lawsuit because the, the, the dispute that why maybe facially dealt with uh, is not really dealt with is really what's going to come up later and, and jump up and bite you, and that's going to be the lawsuit. Um, because invariably your your deal that doesn't address these these confront these confrontational issues head on is is going to be viewed as ambigu ambiguous in its treatment of it, um, and then you're going to be handing to a judge or a jury uh, the task of deciding what your intent truly was. So um, confront the issues, uh, confront them head on. And then once, once they've been resolved, make sure that that resolution is clearly and carefully spelled out um, because disputes do have uh, a tendency to resurrect themselves once a lawsuit gets filed. Even if a lawsuit starts out only involving a singular issue, it, it can very often, because the client will remember, yeah, you remember this other thing that you know, we got screwed on. Let, you know, we should we should bring that out too and fight about that. Um, it's going to happen, but if you confront these issues as they arise, if you confront them head on, and then document the resolution, uh, you'll you'll go a long way towards avoiding uh, having to deal with a guy like me. Um, you know, I, I joke all the time. I'm 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 the guy that you don't want to know uh, because um, certainly my, my transactional partners don't want me to know their clients. They, they want to tell their clients that I exist, but they sure don't want me to talk to them because I'm the guy uh, that you call when everything went to hell and it's my job now to figure out how to resurrect it. So do me a favor and don't draft around the deal. Next. Do capture the whole deal, which is, is very, uh, it's kind of a close cousin to not drafting around the deal. Capture the whole deal. One of the things I, I find very troubling and often um, the focus of a lot of litigation I'm involved in is when issues are identified when the deal is being uh, structured, but not fully resolved. They're resolved enough so that the parties themselves feel comfortable in closing, but they're still out there, or there or they are matters to be decided at a later date. 
And that can happen not simply because of oversight, but because of the realities of the deal. You know, maybe maybe there you have to get opinions later or uh, appraisals or inspections or any number of things that may come up in the future. And uh, that's going to be the subject of a later amendment or a letter agreement or a, or worse off, a side deal. Oh, side deals. They're the deals that nobody really wanted to put down on paper uh, as part of the, the primary contract, but then later, you know, get decided by some sort of a letter agreement, which may or may not be enforceable. Um, given the language of your existing contract. Um, you know, for example, um, I've seen this and I've actually litigated this issue. Uh, the contract was written with a very carefully crafted uh, integration clause. And the integration clause said in it very carefully, uh, in order to amend this contract, there has to be a written agreement signed by all parties and it has to be titled amendment to the contract. That's probably one of the things that I, I probably suggested because um, there's a, in Michigan, there's a Supreme Court decision which says those types of non-waiver or non-amendment clauses can themselves be waived. Um, so even if your contract says you can only amend, it in, amend a, a, a contract in writing, uh, the Supreme Court said, well, no, you can waive the the non-waiver language, and you can still amend it uh, orally uh, if you can show by clear and convincing evidence that that was the party's intent. So to build that into the contract, I said, well, let's do this. Let's put it in clearly that we have to have, you know, an, uh, an amendment that's titled a particular way. It has to say amendment to contract. Okay, so then what's the next thing that happens? The clients get together without the lawyers and they enter into a letter agreement, which, in, which never mentions amendment of the contract, but that's what the, the clients thought they were doing. They didn't come back to the lawyer because they thought they were gonna save some money. Well, guess what? Now there's a, an entire lawsuit over whether this letter agreement is enforceable because it didn't comply with the contract as was, as was originally drafted. Um, so my preference is to certainly leave out side deals and, and as I've said, capture the whole deal. Um, and, and actually, I was gonna say this at the end, but I'll, I'll throw this in now about amendments because in my experience, amendments are oftentimes where all the rules of the road that we're talking about today, for some reason, get forgotten. And oftentimes it's because the amendment was written not by the lawyer or by a different lawyer or different lawyers, um, and sometimes even by different parties. If, if after the contract was signed, uh, one or more of the parties were transferred or sold, um, but the contract lives on, and then these new parties go to amend it. So they're drafting, they're amending a contract that they didn't draft. Well, they tend to violate just about every rule I'm talking about today, certainly the ones that talk about consistently using terms and confronting the deal and, and capturing the whole deal. Um, because when you amend the contract, and oftentimes the amendment might be very simple. It might simply say, you know, in a commercial lease, for example, um, the lease uh, uh, term is going to be extended uh, five more years. I've seen that, where that's all it says. Okay, maybe that's good, but if you go back to the original lease, can you tell when, when the lease actually began? Again, I go back to my example of the lease commencement date or the start date or the acceptance date. Which date is it? I had a case, again, this is a different lawsuit, but I had a case where that very thing came up. 
the lease was drafted. It was a 10-year lease with two five-year options. Um, and then during the second option, there was a side agreement to amend the lease by the landlord uh, to extend it for another uh, 10 years, two, two, two new five-year options. But what was critically missing from all the documents is whether a percentage rent clause was supposed to be included in the options themselves. To make matters worse, the side deal was struck while the landlord was selling the building. And then when the tenant went to exercise the new option with the percentage rent clause, which is nowhere stated in the prime lease itself, well, there's your lawsuit. The, the new owner said, I don't know anything about this. I wasn't part of that. It's not in the lease. And that was another, that was two years of litigation um, over whether this percentage rent clause, which was a, was a multi-million dollar item applied, putting aside whether the tenant even had the right to renew because the landlord wanted to take the, this was, this was back when rents were still increasing like gangbusters. The new landlord thought this was an opportunity to, to bring the, the, the lease up to a market rate. So it, it was a quote unquote mess. Um, so when, when amendments are created and drafted and put into this, it's, it's not enough to simply write down on paper and have everybody sign what has changed. Somebody has to go back and see how that change is going to affect anything else that might uh, be touched in the original deal. All right. Number eight, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because I think we're going to run out of time. Number eight, don't be af afraid of lawyering up the deal. Uh, and this kind of borrows back to the point I was making before about confronting all of the issues. Um, and I, and I, again, I, I'm very cognizant of the pressures that are put on transactional lawyers to get the deals closed. Um, so what I'm talking about, about lawyering up the deal is, and we'll touch upon this a little bit, uh, maybe if we get time, um, using the opportunity to, during the, during the drafting stage, to do a litigation review. Have somebody like me look at your, your deal or parts of your deal that you think might create problems. Um, And I'm not suggesting that we simply make make it longer, add new sections, add new paragraphs, add new appendices, add new documents. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding where your problems may arise and consulting with other experts, whether they be, you know, if if you're doing a commercial lease, for example, but there's a lending component bring in a banking lawyer. If there's a real property issue, bring in an environmental lawyer. Uh, and by all means, uh, bring in the litigator who can tell you where, you know, you, there might be some gaps. Okay, moving on again. This is the corollary to not being afraid to lawyer up the deal is do be afraid of lawyering up the deal. And by that, I mean, um, as I said, you, you, you can't negotiate over everything. Um, and when you try to negotiate every single point, I, I've seen contracts where, and I'm, I'm not kidding here, the, the pages of defined terms went on for 21 pages of defined terms. And the contract itself is only 60 pages long. And it it was it was a mess. Uh, many of the terms overlapped. Many of them conflicted. Many of them 
were ambiguous, um, and yet they, in, in each instance, uh, when talking with the, the folks who were involved in it, uh, they could they could very clearly tell me why uh, each definition was included and why they thought it was important at the time. Um, but again, I, I think that was a that was a, a fairly unusual but apt example of lawyering up the deal to the point where it became unworkable. So um, in that effort, you are going to find with complexity become comes ambiguity and inconsistency, inconsistency, and that and that simply needs to be avoided. Number ten. This is the one that nobody wants to talk about. Preparing for the dispute. I, I have spent my entire career representing entrepreneurs who, even in the midst of a full-blown lawsuit, can't come to grips with the idea that they did something wrong or they missed something. But it does happen. We all know that happens. So. When you're drafting the deal, you may as well think about what's going to happen in a fight. And this is often in the boilerplate section of the of the contract. Um, and people say, "Well, we've got a you know choice of uh, uh, jurisdiction. We've got an arbitration. We've got this. We've got that." Not enough, because if you've if you've been careful to document through your negotiation where the points of dispute truly are, those are likely going to be the same points of dispute that you're going to be fighting over in a lawsuit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so when you're, when you're, uh, when you're drafting, uh, start with the obvious. Uh, and we flip by it, but start with the careful integration language. Um, there, there are books written about how to draft integration language. Um, a lot of times those will work, but a lot of times people will just assume that, well, I, I always put an integration clause in it. I've never had an issue before, so my integration language is fine. N not really. Um, Maybe we'll do a maybe we'll do a, a webinar on integration clauses, but I'm going to run out of time, so let me move on. Choice of law, choice of forum. I'm not talking about choice of venue. There's a Michigan Supreme Court case that says parties can't choose venue. You can consent, but it's not necessarily enforceable in the in a, in a, on a court in the event of a dispute, because the legislature has created a venue statute that says where where lawsuits are supposed to be tried. But you can consent to jurisdiction. You can consent to venue, but just understand that in a fight, uh, the court still has the authority to transfer it for the convenience of the parties and the witnesses. Um, when you are in a dispute, um, and again, I know this is antithetical to, to trying to close the deal, but it's not a bad idea to talk about what, what's going to happen when these things do arise. What is your default provision going to say? Oftentimes, you know, the default section will say, you know, in the event of default, which is typically a defined term, uh, the, you know, party A has to do these things and uh, these three things, and then party B will have the opportunity to do those things. On April 18th, the Michigan Court of Appeals decided a case called Simmons Properties where um, in the default clause, and this was a lease, uh, the language said that if the lessee shall default in complying with any of the terms, conditions, or obligations of this agreement, then the lessor may serve written notice upon the lessee to cure the default within five days. Well. The lessee later was alleged to have defaulted and then said, well, but I didn't get my five days. Well, the court looked at this and said, well, you weren't entitled to five days because it says lessor may serve, not shall. So sometimes 
rights and obligations can turn on a simple choice of a word like that. You need to know. Um, include things like notice. If there is a notice, how does it have to be sent? Can it be sent by email? Does it have to be sent by first class mail? Does it have to be sent by certified mail? Where? You know, oftentimes the, the place where notice is to be sent when the deal is drafted isn't even germane at the time a default is. So there's now you've got an ambiguity as to where the notice needs to be sent. Time limits to sue. You can reduce in certain contracts the time to sue, even if the statute of limitation says you have three years to sue, your contract can say, nope, you only have a year. Alternate dispute resolutions procedures, you might, this is becoming very popular, where uh, courts want to send you to facilitation right away. Well, you can build that into your own contract and say, before anyone can file a lawsuit, you must go through a facilitation procedure and then write down what the procedure is. Arbitration. That's, that's another whole webinar on its own, but um, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I can't touch that. There's just too much to talk about on what the arbitration clauses need to say or should say. You can limit damages. Certainly, you can limit consequential damages, and you know, certain contracts under the UCC, there's, there's requirements for that, very careful requirements. Thief shifting, you know, who's going to pay for the dispute? Choice of law, choice of venue. You can choose your venue. It's not enforceable, but you can choose it. Um, you certainly want to have consent to jurisdiction, consent to, to personal jurisdiction in Michigan, if that's where you want to fight. Had a case. And this, is, this is not at all unusual. We sued in Michigan, but there was language in the document that says, well, yeah, but the contract says you gotta, you got to sue in Delaware. Well, then we... We had a long, and the, and the case got transferred to Delaware. Well, now I'm faced with having to transfer it back because all of the people, by the time the lawsuit got filed, were Michigan people. Delaware had only a very tangential relationship to the dispute. So these are the things that you got to think about at the beginning. Um, and frankly, uh, are things that should be re revisited um, in the future. Uh, certainly these dispute uh, resolution procedures. Um, moving on, I said it was 10. Well, we have more than 10. Number 11, very self-evident. Don't skip the proofread. Um, clients very often rely upon the lawyers. Lawyers very often rely on the associate. The associate very often might rely on the secretary. Wow. Problems just waiting to happen. Every time a change is made, certainly every time a change is made in a defined term, you can't just use your computer to find that word everywhere in the document and change it. Um, it sometimes doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it's not going to catch everything. You've, it's, it can be painstaking, but you really need to go back and look at the whole document every time there is a, a change and make sure that change is consistently applied throughout the document. Uh, number 12, this is very relate, closely related to number 11, make sure the client reads and approves all the documents. I, I know that sounds obvious, and I know lawyers do it, but it isn't going to be enough to simply send it to the client. Um, it's always a good idea to make sure if there is a material change from a prior draft, make sure you spell that out in the communication or, or client. If you get a document from your lawyer and you're not sure what the changes are or how it affects what's going on, it's not enough to simply give a red line and assume everyone's going to understand it. Take 10 minutes, sit down with your lawyer or with your client and walk through all those changes and make sure everybody knows what's going on. Last thing in the world a lawyer wants to do when a dispute arises is to get sideways with the client because the client says, well, you never told me about that or I didn't know this was going to happen. Um, that can create a real problem. Um, all right. So 
we have about four minutes left. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions, so I'm going to ask John to... Yep. I'll jump back yeah. on here. Um, here's, uh, as I mentioned up front, everybody, if you haven't uh, found it yet, take a look in your uh, dashboard tool there, the section for questions. You can type those in uh, right now, and we'll try to get Matt to answer a couple of them. I, we have a couple, so uh, please do that if you can. Um, the first one is, do we need to fret over every word in every contract in order for it to be effective? Of course not. Uh, of course you don't. But you do need to fret over the material words, and you need to rely upon the lawyer to tell you which, which what those material words are. But but this, that borrows back into this whole notion of being consistent throughout the document or documents uh, with your your terms and how they're used. Um, so no, it's not necessary to fret over every word. But as you saw in that example I gave, the difference between a may and a shall was the difference between winning and losing the lawsuit. And if you're not careful in fretting over those types of words, um, they can cause serious problems for you or for your client. Great. Um, here's a new, another question. Um, can you go back over the venue question what was the Michigan rule that you referenced, um, and what is your experience with other states with regard to choice of venue? This is a Michigan rule. You're going to have to look at, at the individual state. But in Michigan, and, and I could dig out the case site. I don't have it off the top of my head. But I was just talking with a partner of mine yesterday about this. Venue, and venue, venue is, you're going to find a venue statute in every state. But how those venue statutes are interpreted are not necessarily going to be the same. In Michigan, the Michigan Supreme Court has said that because the legislature has spelled out in a statute how venue is determined. For example, in the general, general venue statute, um, venue is determined based upon the residence, uh, the principal place of business, and or where a defendant is doing business. So if you have multiple defendants, venue is proper in any venue where you have a single defendant who lives there, a single defendant who does business there, or a single dependent, uh, defendant whose principal place of business is there, even if no one else is. You can still move it out, but now you're, now you're in the Michigan court rules about how to transfer venue when venue is proper. So what I'm saying here is, um, I'm not saying don't include choice of venue in your contract, but understand if that contract is going to be enforced in Michigan, um, you can't rely upon that exclusively. You're still going to be subject to uh, Michigan venue law uh, and the rules and procedures for transferring venue under the Michigan court rules. Great. Um, just as a reminder, if you want to type in a question in the questions queue, look for that window on your dashboard. I see one more at this point, and if no others pop up, we will conclude. The last question, Matt, I have for you is, do you suggest litigation attorneys actually working with transactional attorneys to put together a deal? Yes and no. Um, as I said, yes, when during the negotiations, uh, disputes arise and attempts are being made to satisfy everyone's concern. The dispute never goes away, but the transactional lawyer then documents the deal and the, the two sides say, yeah, we can live with that language and we can live with that language. But in reality, the, the, the dispute never went anywhere. You've just, you've just papered it over. Um, that, that's certainly something you might want to take to a litigation lawyer and say, Look at this language and tell me what you think. Um, or if you're not sure about, you know, your dispute provisions, your default sections, your choice of law, all those, all those litigation-related sections that you'll find in the boilerplate, if you haven't had somebody look at those in a while, then I would say, yeah, um, you should have a litigation lawyer look at this and, and give you an opinion as to whether, you know, changes need to be made depending upon what your goals are. But I, I don't 
I'm not suggesting for a moment that you need to bring the litigation lawyer into the negotiation room, um, you know, to, 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 to sit and watch you as you're negotiating your deal. That's, that's a waste of time and, and money. Um, but experienced lawyers will know as that negotiation proceeds and as the documentation is proceeding where they think there might be issues. And, and oftentimes they're where they're taking their own forms and having to make material changes to them based upon the insistence of the other side. That, that, that should be a flag in and of itself to say, you know what, I should have a litigation lawyer look at this and make sure I'm not setting myself up for something. Perfect. Okay, I don't see any other questions at this point, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap things up. Um, just in conclusion for today, I wanna let everybody know you're gonna receive a link, a uh, survey link. So we would really appreciate it if you take just a few moments to complete that. Um, any feedback you provide us, especially with regard to topics, we take that to heart. We try to work those into our future programs. So um, we're working on the rest of our 2019 lineup right now. So that feedback is very important to us. Also, I'd like to just uh, point out again that today's recording will be available hopefully later today or tomorrow morning for today's program. So if you have a colleague or friend that's missed it, uh, please point to our event page on our website, plunkacootie.com. Uh, a quick plug for our Don't Bet the Business blog. If you're not aware of this, this is also on our website. Great place uh, to go for information about business risk management. Matt does a lot of the heavy lifting on this blog. We have some other contributors here in the firm as well. So um, please check that out on our website. And on behalf of Matt and all the members of the Commercial Litigation Practice Group, we wanna thank you for taking time for being with us today. And we wish you the best uh, for the rest of the day. Bye everyone.